Okay, good. Yeah, so good morning. So you are part of the crowd of the early birds to make it here at nine. So it's a pleasure to welcome you here. Um, of course, my thanks also to the organizers to provide me with the opportunity to address this nice audience and to meet friends and colleagues here in Dresden uh, at a nice time of the year. So that is really a pleasure. And uh, now, um, early on, I also would uh, like to uh, acknowledge the collaborations I enjoyed with a couple of colleagues um, in the past as well as ongoing. Um, and the topic of my talk is about uh, capillary forces on colloids. So actually, it was not our intention to study systems with long-range interactions. So we were interested in two-dimensional structures. And then it turned out uh, in the course of time that the particularly long range of the interactions in these kind of systems uh, fits in the scheme uh, of this uh, workshop. Uh, now, as a sort of introduction, I would like to say that we are used to the fact that condensed matter and its structures sensitively depend on spatial dimension. And therefore, there is a particular interest to study systems which are uh, quasi-exactly two-dimensional in character. And this is accomplished by colloidal particles which you deposit at fluid interfaces. So now, that's better. OK, so I have now to juggle with these. So at least as long as they are not three pieces, uh, I, I try to manage. Yeah, so the very fact I want to say is that the binding energy of these colloids to the interface is extremely strong. It's typically in the order of 10 to 6 kBT. And therefore, once such a colloid gets at the interface, it stays there basically forever. And uh, these structures uh, have both an interest in uh, basic research as well as uh, in far as applications are concerned. So uh, a famous example is a study of two-dimensional melting. There has been quite a theoretical effort in the past, so that led to the costal Saulus transition. And uh, it was the first time when it was observed absolutely clearly was uh, in terms of colloidal particles at water-air interfaces. So here you see it uh, at low temperatures, rather ordered, and then you undergo a melting. And this has been analyzed to very great, de great detail and universal features have been detected. So that was uh, an early, really, accomplishment uh, in dealing with two-dimensional systems. And the other interesting aspect is that these colloidal particles can also form clusters, ordered, and now you can fix them on a solid substrate by dipping it into the water and pulling it out again, and then you have these kind of clusters fixed at the solid substrates. And that, again, is interesting for optical applying applications and uh, scattering and so on. So that's actually the, the background of it. And now, the further advantage of these systems is that basically with your naked eye, you are able to monitor what's going on. So you do not have extraordinary experimental efforts to monitor what's going on. You, you basically see it. Uh -huh. Does it not work? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Does it now work? Great. Fantastic. And I have two, ten minutes in addition, of course. So we make a deal in that direction. 
Yeah, and so if you now look at them, these are examples, and uh, here you see also the length scales involved. And actually, I very much like this app upper panel here. So you basically get everything there. You get monomers, so individual ones, these are here. You get dimers, for example, here. You get trimers over here. Uh, and it just keeps going. You, you see five, six, seven, and so on. So this is, I think, a particularly nice example of what you see. And ob obviously, there are attractive interactions. So there is nothing which uh, uh, presses these collides towards a cluster, but it's intrinsic interaction among them. And uh, here you see then uh, a bit on a larger scale how beautiful kind of structures emerge there. Uh, here, for example, in that panel, there we have a mixture of three types of colloids uh, between one, three, and five micrometer in size. And then you see, for example, depletion areas appearing there. Um, and also here and here. So you have then an unbelievable wealth of phenomena you can uh, observe in these kind of systems. Uh, the upper panel here shows just the uh, accuracy with which you can accomplish these ordered structures. So this is uh, like drilled, but it's actually self-organized. Uh, and here you have it in even larger scales so that you really can look at them. And as soon as these particles deviate from spherical symmetry, become elongated particles, then the type of structures is unbelievably rich. So this is what you get here if you have then ellipsoids instead of spheres. And you can imagine that uh, self-assembly with these kind of elements gives you, again, additional degrees of freedom. And here you have the interaction of rod-like particles with a micro-post so that you can uh, also locate them in space at designated areas. Well, now, the kind of interactions which are acting on these particles are capillary forces. And they basically come about by the deformation of this fluid interface. And this is described by a displacement field I called U. And what happens is that there is a pressure acting, a locally varying pressure acting on this interface. And the interface answers by changing its shape. And so what you actually want to know is, provided you have given such kind of a lateral pressure, uh, what is the kind of structure of the interface which will appear? Now, in most of the interesting cases, the amplitudes of these deformations are pretty small. So that you have an approximation that the gradient, the lateral gradient of this U mentioned as quantity, and it's usually much smaller than one. Which means that then the differential equation which describes the shape of this interface is here given by the Young-Laplace equation. It basically says that the system tries to minimize the surface area of this interface. And the surface area is square root of 1 plus gradient u squared, and you expand it, and then you end up here with the young Laplace equation. And this uh, equation contains the external pressure you apply. And here, what enters is the capillary length, which is determined by the surface tension and the mass density contrast between the two coexisting phases, uh, such that here, this acts like a mass in this uh, 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 Laplace equation. The important aspect is that this capillary length is at your experimental uh, disposal because you can modify the strength of the surface tension, for example, by changing temperature, or you can add surfactants to it, and then you have a huge variation in the strength of the surface tension. That means this object here is a knob you can play with. Uh, this can also be... Uh, 
uh, described in terms of lateral forces acting on such kind of a part of the interface. And uh, this force is actually given by the curvature integral around here, the three-phase contact line. And here, uh, this is expressed in terms of the displacement field. The capillary length typically is an object which is rather large. So it's typically in the order of a millimeter and, uh, and larger. But uh, typically, it's large compared to the size of the collides which you deposit at this interface. Now, let's start, first of all, to describe the system uh, in terms of capillary forces acting on a single colloid. So we just want to know what happened to a single one. And this is shown here on the left-hand side. So this is the Laplace equation I just uh, uh, mentioned before. And here is the description in terms of the force. And now what is very striking is that the mathematics of it just tells you that uh, you have a nice analogy between gravitational and electrostatic phenomena. So here on the left-hand side, we have our interface problem with the deformation. And here, this corresponds to the situation of gravitational potential. So this U plays the role of the gravitational potential. The capillary length is like a screening length for the electrostatic. The density of the vertical force pi entering here plays the role of a mass density up to a sign. Uh, the vertical force with which you can pull these collides uh, is minus the mass. And uh, you encounter here the particle interface contact line and this is a generator for multipolar moments, as indicated here. So what we should keep in mind is now that these effective capillary interactions uh, lead to the same problem as a screened gravity, but in 2D. And that is something which, so to say, our friends from cosmology, they cannot modify by hand the gravitational potential. It's there at all scales. But here, in our case, we are able, uh, by changing the capillary length, we have a tool to have a screening length there, which we can shift forth and back. Now, once we have understood a single particle, let's now study two colloids. And so the phenomenon is uh, as follows that uh, here you have a single particle which generates a deformation of this interface. A second particle does that the same. And these displacements superimpose and give rise to a mutual attraction. And uh, here I have indicated a situation in which, for example, by external means, for example, by an electric field, you can pull the uh, colloidal particle, so it's a bit along, uh, pulled out of the water. Uh, this is then a capillary monopole corresponding to the vertical force. Uh, the capillary force between the two is then the derivative of the potential energy for this configuration. And you can solve this, and this is just given in terms of a Bessel function, which depends on the distance between these two particles in units of the capillary length. And the amplitude is set by the force with which you pull, and uh, in the denominator we have the surface tension. Here it's plotted, this capillary interaction, and the properties are such that, first of all, over a certain range, this potential decays logarithmically, that is, very slowly. That is the 2D version of, of gravity. And then finally, however, at a crossover given set by the capillary length, this crosses over to an ultimate exponential decay governed by the decay length set by the capillary length. And this is, so to say, the key element that now you have a, a means to decrease or increase the range of the interaction. Now, uh, typically, we have interparticle separations of the order of 10 to 100 micrometer, the capillary length being about one millimeter. 
That means that the so-called plasma parameter, which counts the number of interacting neighbors, is given by this ratio. And typically, this is much larger than 1. And that means that you are there really probing the long-ranged interaction. And here I again emphasize that the quantity is lambda, the capillary length, the external force, the surface tension, the size of the particle, and the nearest neighbor interaction at distance is all are easily tunable experimental parameters. Now we had understood one particle, two particles. Now let's study several particles. Uh, this is shown up here. So this pressure I now idealize by having point-like particles which are pulled out of, of the water. Uh, and then this displacement field is given uh, by this logarithmic uh, interaction. And here, again, I have written down the potential which corresponds to this distance. And we have then the gravitational potential. What I meant in the introduction was that um, this trapping energy is very strong, but it depends sensitively on the size of the particles. Namely, this uh, pulling force is proportional to the uh, cube of the radius of the colloidal particle. This enters in the potential quadratically, which means that the potential depends on the sixth power of the radius of the particle. So that changing the size of the particle has a dramatic effect on these potentials. Now, uh, here I introduce you to the fact that you have not only monopoles and then in the next stage dipoles, but you have all higher dipole moments, which are generated typically by having non-spherical particles at play. And this is displaced here, where I have put on an ellipsoid deposited on this interface. And the first observation is that this colloidal particle sinks into the interface such as to accomplish the prescribed contact angle of the liquid vapor interface forming with the surface of this colloidal particle. And these contact angles, they are just determined in terms of surface tension, so they are materials parameters. And so if you choose a certain type of material, you get a certain contact angle. And then you want to like to know what is the shape of the three-phase contact line which appears. And that turns out that if you are deviating from a spherical object, the three-phase contact line no longer lives in a two-dimensional plane, but it is, has to escape out of the plane. That is, the three-phase contact line is no longer a planar object. And this is indicated here, so you see that the interface here uh, bulges up. And this means that you generate higher order multiples of the interaction, uh, as shown here. And uh, of course, the theoretical description becomes then more complicated. And uh, this also influences the range of the interactions. And uh, it also then depends on whether these particles are tip to tail or whether they are parallel to each other. And uh, there is now also some experimental evidence which is compatible with the theoretical predictions. Uh, now, if you uh, can now spice up the problem by introducing charges to the problem, as indicated up here, uh, which means then that uh, it's particularly responsive to external electric fields uh, in this sense that the electric field which emanates from these charges uh, gets out of the liquid and puts on a pressure on the liquid interface and deforms it. And uh, this is here indicated uh, as a reference configuration. Up here, you have just a sphere accomplishing here the contact angle, and it's uh, an undeformed interface. But now, if you switch on an external field, you press the particle down, and you get then here a dipole-dipole interaction. The theoretical prescription is then formulated in terms of the free energy expression, 
the upper one here is the change of surface area multiplied by the surface tension. And here we have the restoring force due to the capillary length. The next contribution is that you have to take into account pulling the meniscus. This is this piece, the pressure times the displacement field. And finally, pushing the colloid. That means uh, external force acting against uh, a change in height of the center here. And finally, you have to uh, take into account that um, the surface free energies of the colloids are different from the liquid vapor interface and here from the colloid vapor interface. So you have these different surface tensions, and this is taken into account by here. Now, once you have a model which tells you how this pressure looks like, then you just have to minimize this free energy and uh, taking the difference of the free energy for a fixed particle-particle distance relative to the one at uh, large separation gives you an attractive interaction. Now, there is also a direct interaction between these collides, and this uh, comes from the charges here, and this is typically a repulsive interaction. And then you see already there a competition between an attractive piece coming from the capillary interactions and a repulsive one from direct interactions. And if you work this out, then uh, another length case comes into play. This is the so-called De Bayeux screening length, which says uh, uh, about the screening of these Coulomb interactions. And uh, in the case that uh, the screening length is uh, fulfills this inequality with respect to the reference configuration. Uh, this was the previous one. Here, this is the reference radius here. And uh, that has to be put into ratio with the uh, De Bayeux screening length. And then you see here that indeed what you build up here is a minimum in the interaction, but uh, that very much depends on these ratios here. And so properly you have to take into account also the repulsive interaction, and the net result of superimposing them is shown here on the right panel, and uh, there indeed you do observe a minimum. Now, uh, there are certain conditions that this minimum appears, and that means that uh, the Bayeux screening length is comparable to R, and uh, this is a small perturbation, and here the colloidal charge density should reach these kind of values, which are rather large. And um, so a, a slight disadvantage in this description is that this minimum now happens to occur relatively close to the two particles, which means that an asymptotic approximation is difficult to uh, maintain numerically valid. Now, you can now also study what happens if you now replace your liquid by a more complicated complex fluid, a pneumatic, and you can now study what happens if you now deposit these colloids upon a nematic film, which means that here you have now elastic interactions in the nematic film due to the presence of your colloidal particles here. And this gives an interesting extra contribution to the interaction, which is also governed by the topological defects which appear here and here. And what you find out here is that then this elastic uh, interaction follows this power law here, and this is a quadrupolar repulsion, whereas then the contribution from the meniscus is this combination. So you get here rather interesting long-range interactions, and they are also competing with each other. And the nice aspect, which also was experimentally exploited, is that these interactions depend also sensitively on the thickness of this pneumatic film. And you, the kind of 
configurations which appear at this interface, as you can see here, they are very sensitive depending on about the thickness of this pneumatic film. So the structure formation you see here can be tuned by changing this pneumatic film thickness. And um, that would basically deserve a talk of its own, the kind of wealth of phenomena which appear here with these pneumatics. Now, another problem uh, which I would like to address is that so far we have studied the interface which is asymptotically flat. And here we now what we do is that we pull the particle with an external force on a sessile droplet. So you have a droplet in contact with a substrate, and now you would like to know uh, what is the optimal position of this particle on the surface of this drop once it is pulled a little bit out of the water. And what turns out is that the answer of this question depends sensitively on whether the contact line is free or whether it is pinned. In the case that it is free, the minimum of the angle here, this is the angle, is at zero. That is, the particle likes to stay on the top of the droplet, whereas in the case that the interface three-phase contact line is pinned, uh, you have a certain preferred angle. So it's here something like 50 degrees. So there's a very specific angle these particles do prefer. And this is displayed here as the free energy landscape. Uh, this is what happens if you fix one colloidal particle at a certain position in the, at the surface, and now you want to ask if you add a second one, where does the second one go? And it turns out that they like each other very much, and that is the black ones. They sit over here. There are metastable states, which are uh, uh, on the opposite, so uh, there are also configurations where they prefer to sit at the three-phase contact line, but uh, this is not always so. And on the far side of the moon, there are no minima at all, so the particles want to be here where the first particle has been deposited. <clears throat> now, so far we have neglected thermal fluctuations of the interface. Now, we want to study what happens to the effective interaction between these particles if you allow for capillary waves here, thermally excited capillary waves. They are undercut by the presence of these colloidal particles, and this changes the free energy spectrum, and this gives rise to an additional fluctuation-induced force. And there are now various ways to do that. You can allow uh, the particles to fluctuate too, or they are pinned, or the contact line is pinned. There's a whole zoo of possibilities. Here are the, are the uh, configurations. So here they, it's a pinned interface, pinned interface, and the colloid is pinned. In this case, you have an extremely long-range entrop entropic interaction, the log of a log. It's attractive. Uh, if you now let the three-phase contact line fluctuate on the surface of the colloid instead of having it pinned, but the colloids are still fixed, you get this kind of uh, uh, attractive interaction, and then you, you just can play it through uh, and you encounter then uh, various power laws depending on which kind of fluctuations you unfreeze. Now, uh, so far we are into, have been interested in the static properties. Now let's turn to dynamics. And uh, here again, I remind you of the basic interactions uh, that here describes the uh, displacement field of the interface in the presence of a certain density field, a two-dimensional density field, density field of the colloids. So we have now a whole ensemble of colloids. And we now want to describe what happens to such a cluster of these colloidal particles. Then you have here particle conservation. And then uh, 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 dynamics is governed by an overdamped Stokes in dynamics, which is absolutely suitable for here. So here you have uh, uh, no inertial uh, phenomena, so you don't have uh, hydrodynamic, uh, hydrodynamics to do, but uh, Stokesian dynamics. <clears throat> 
And this here is uh, the corresponding mirror with self-gravitating fluids. You have this to compare with that. That's the same thing, provided you kill here the contribution from the capillary length. You have particle conservation. And here you do have, of course, inertial Newton dynamics. And uh, so in this case, what we are studying here on the left column is, so to say, the cosmology in the Petri dish. Now, what is the kind of dynamics? So uh, I provide you here with a flow diagram. So you start out with an initial distribution of the colloids. This is a certain density rho naught. Then you feed this in into the Laplace equation or screen Poisson equation. This way you obtain then the displacement field for this kind of initial configuration. Then you feed this into the dynamic uh, equation which is governed by uh, what you get from dynamic density function theory. So density function theory here in terms of classical liquids, not electronic degrees of freedom, but the classical liquids. And uh, this, uh, I, I have no time to get into the details how you derive that, but the point is that this dynamic density function theory provides you with the time evolution of this uh, density. And then you, from feeding in the rho naught and the u, you get then rho of t, and then you run the whole thing uh, until iteratively until you get a stable solution. So that's the way you get the time dependence of this uh, clustering. Now, the point we now want to make is that uh, we want to know what is the capillary energy in such a cluster um, in the case that once the cluster is larger or smaller compared to the capillary length. And that makes a huge difference. So here I have the capillary length in that case being large compared to the size of the cluster, and here the opposite. And it turns out that the energy density in the lower case is independent of the size of the cluster. So this here cancels out with this, whereas in the opposite case here, it scales like log L times L squared. So that means you have a, a significant difference uh, depending on the size of the cluster compared to the capillary length. Now, this cap uh, uh, capillary interaction, they would like to crush the uh, cluster, but then you have opposing to that a two-dimensional pressure which comes about due to thermal motion of these particles. For example, they are hard disks sitting there, and they give rise to a pressure which opposes the contraction governed by the capillary interaction. Now the question is, who wins? Either you crush them, they have collapse, or that they... Uh, uh, stay where they are, or if they even evaporate. And the statement now is that if you equate the capillary energy density with the one which comes about from the repulsive interactions among them, the, the size of the cluster which fulfills this equality is what is called the uh, genes length, which is, so to say, in the uh, cosmology community well known since more than 100 years by now. And the statement now we find is that once this genes length is large compared to the capillary length, all the clusters are stable. If, however, on the opposite, the genes length falls below the capillary length, then only clusters which are sufficiently small are stable, and all clusters with a size beyond the genes length, they do collapse. And this can be understood also in terms of linear stability uh, analysis. So typically linear expansion, and here you have then the exponential growth. And it turns now out that um, the whole thing is governed by the genes length and the genes time, which sets the time scale for the growth of the perturbation. And uh, what now you can figure out is that if the capillary length 
I divide it by the genes length is less than one, all modes are stable. But once this becomes larger than one, you see here the exponential collapse occurring. So this is what you get from this analysis. And now you would like to know uh, whether, so to say, uh, these this collapse is experimentally accomplishable. And this is indeed the case. The conditions uh, are given here by the capillary lengths much larger than the uh, nearest neighbor distance. And here the uh, genes length, which is 1 over k, has to be smaller than lambda and larger than the size of the colloid. And then this enters here in a uh, dimensionless quantity, which here is denoted by Q. And this tells you now, putting in real numbers for various kinds of values of this Q, here we have uh, 3, 10, and 30, there is a window of opportunity uh, between lambda times k being 1, reaching up to the genes length uh, being equal to the size of the particle. So in this range here, you do see this collapse. Then you would also like to know whether uh, the time scales are suitable for it. And uh, this is shown here. Uh, and for the three examples I showed you, the uh, window of opportunity means that you have to wait either minutes or up to days. But they are reachable time scales. And now you would like to know how, in case it does collapse, what is the kind of dynamics this collapse follows. And um, this can be studied either by Brownian dynamic simulations. I show them uh, results in, in a minute. And uh, uh, it means to solve this uh, diffusion equations where the heads are always dimensionless quantities uh, so that uh, you have here only to deal with uh, non-dimensional objects. And the whole thing can be encapsulated in this ratio which plays the role of an effective temperature. And now you can, first of all, now study this collapse by perturbation theory in a cold collapse where this happens to be zero. And then you get uh, this top hat distribution. They have an, an over density at a certain constant radius. And then as function of time, this shrinks and the hat grows. And this is described here by these time dependencies. And you see here that at a finite time, the uh, size of the cluster reduces to zero, and at this time, this uh, diverges. Now I show you here now the results of the Brownian simulations. And this is shown such that the red particles are those marked which are in close neighborhood with other particles. So the red ones are those who form, so to say, the nucleus of the collapse. And this is uh, shown here for the gravitational collapse. And if I now look at Brownian dynamics simulations for other kind of parameters, and what you see there, a completely different mechanism, namely the shock wave formation. You see here that uh, a shock wave appears now, and this contracts. So this is a significant different kind of dynamics. And then, at the very end, uh, this shows the appearance of a traveling shock wave. Um, you start out with this configuration, and then it bulges up here in forming a shock wave, and the shock wave runs to the center. And this can be captured by a dynamic phase diagram in which you plot here the effective temperature versus the range. And you see here different kinds of mechanism where how this uh, collapse occurs. Here we have a collective collapse, so everything just homogeneously contracts. Uh, the cold collapse was something which occurred here. This uh, transition region 
uh, to the non-collapse, and collapse is formed by shock waves, and out here you observe spinodal decomposition. And this can be just uh, by de described by density profiles, uh, which is shown here, and the position of the panels correspond to the position of the uh, diagram here. So the panel up to the left is shown here, and uh, the other panels correspond to this arrangement here. And then you see quite vividly that here you have the homogeneous gravity uh, collapse. Um, here you have the shockwave formation. And here where you see these density oscillations here and here, this is the hallmark of spinodal decomposition. So by varying these parameters, you can, so to say, switch between the various types of dynamics. And since I have been just reminded to stop here, uh, uh, I think that is the main message I wanted to, to tell you. So think of a system in which you can generate long-range interactions with a knob such that you can have it short-range, exponential decay, or logarithmic uh, long-range forces. You can play with that, and that it gives rise to interesting structures and to a whole variety of different dynamics where you can also, by changing the parameters, uh, have a crossover between rather distinct different types of dynamics. Thank you.